food and the sea. Our courts at every level, from awarding benefits to the disabled or prosecuting white-collar crime, have failed, screwed, and deceived us. They have failed to dispense justice. We lack Solomons on the vast majority of our courts. Crime continues to grow. It's not a matter of being soft on crime. It's that the United States hasn't really invested in any real crime reduction. The U.S. is more harsh on crime than any of the modern industrial nations. It is the last modern nation to still practice the death penalty. And it executes those under 18. About 52 offenses in the United States require the death penalty. And with all this, crime still persists. Crime even extends to the White House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives. We can't get past the materialism. Even when some of us have enough, it's not enough. Unemployment, slums, and poverty are sources of crime, while wealth contributes to crime by unleashing greed. The Reagan economic policies gave money to the haves at the expense of the working poor. Business Week wrote that these wealth transfers hurt the poor. The equalizing trends between 1930s and the 1970s were reversed in the 1980s. It is now clear that the gap between the haves and the have-nots is greater now than at any time since 1929. It is evident that our society rewards behavior we might like to eliminate. How is it that we don't refer to work-related deaths as murder? Also, why aren't accidents caused by companies who cheat or lie considered murder if people die? We, the people, are cheated out of more money as a result of price-fixing, monopolistic practices, and from consumer deception and embezzlement than from all property crimes in the FBI's index combined. These crimes are rarely punished. In fact, our perception of crime identifies it with the poor. Violence committed by corporations is never viewed as a crime. About 100,000 deaths occur each year from occupational diseases. Deaths yearly from crime amount to around 10,500. In 1988, the big drug companies Lilly and Smith Klein pled guilty to withholding information from the FDA concerning deaths and life-threatening adverse reactions. Why cannot it be said that Lilly killed 49 people while Smith Klein killed 36? Poverty is caused by lack of money. In a wealthy society like ours, poverty exists because we allow it. There are about 350,000 homeless people in America. And the numbers for the poor keep growing. In 1980, we counted 25.2 million poor people in our midst. And in 1990, the number was 30.1 million. While in 1995, it had grown to 35.6 million. Today, the numbers are worse. The poor die earlier as a result of their poverty. One thing is very clear, that a prosperous society that allows poverty in its midst is a party to murder. Poverty injures, hurts, and kills. Only Republican conservatives refuse to admit that there is a bias against poor people throughout our justice system. During the Reagan years, wolves infiltrated our national safety net programs in an effort to sabotage them and to find ways to deny rightful benefits to those in need. These political acts found comrades in our courts. Conservative judges have come up with mythological precedents that only crazy, that only make sense to the schizophrenic mind. 
An example of this crazy thinking is the 1986 Kidda versus the director of, of office workers' uh, compensation programs, which denied black lung benefits to disabled survivors of those who suffered from black lung disease. Kidda relies on Social Security law that states that one, when one works, one is no longer disabled. Judges have also emasculated the Americans with Disabilities Act, so much so that an ADA Restoration Act is moving through Congress. Our courts are waging a, a covert and overt war against the disabled and the poor. Prisons are now the national courthouse. Our criminal justice system swims in racial discrimination and economic bias. White-collar crime in 1994 cost us $208.5 billion. And corporate executives who commit these crimes rarely end up in jail. There's a white-collar criminal in the White House. In one two-year period, the federal government charged nearly two-thirds of the Fortune 500 corporations with violations of the law. And this is a Christian nation? Only 11 out of every 100 suspects investigated by the SEC are ever prosecuted. Also, the wealthy are never treated like common criminals, while the poor are actually punished before they are found guilty. No bail, they can't defend their own case, and they can't afford a lawyer. Blacks and Hispanics get longer sentences than whites for the same crimes. Can we all say Rush Limbaugh? Corporations that commit crimes usually are fined, and this just becomes a cost of doing business. The savings and loan bailout caused by Ronald Reagan's stupid regulate, deregulation ideas cost the taxpayers $480.9 billion. And 70 to 80% of these failures were due to fraud. The banks were looted for personal gain. Conservative ideologues claim only an individual responsibility for crime. For them, there is no social responsibility for crime. Our society encourages everyone to be a success. But the avenues to success are open only to some. Opportunity is not for everyone. Competitive capitalism produces egotistical motives and undermines compassion for the misfortunes of others. And this makes human beings more capable of preying on their fellows without moral inhibition or remorse. David Gordon, a political economist, states the case clearly. Capitalism provokes crime. Capitalism feeds on inequalities. Without competition, it would be much more difficult to induce workers to work in alienating environments. Without competition, workers might not be inclined to struggle to improve their relative income status in society by working harder. And this, in the conservative mind, is why the middle class must be destroyed. Conservatives ain't, can't, can't tolerate a contented working class. Work for its own sake. Work that is fulfilling and not forced or not viewed as punishment. The conservative idea of linking crime and poverty creates hostility toward the poor. In the conservative mind, poverty is a sign of poor or weak character. Do we ever ascribe weak character to justices on the U.S. Supreme Court? No, not unless they vote for Democrats. Throughout the industrial age in America, there's always been bad blood 
between bosses and workers. Police, Pinkertons, Army troops, and National Guard forces have been used against workers to protect capital against the attempts of labor to organize in defense of its interests. The United States, without a doubt, has had the bloodiest and most violent labor history of any industrialized nation in the world. These attitudes are still with us today. Our social system, for its continued operation, needs a set of beliefs to secure the allegiance of the less well-off majority. These beliefs must be, in some considerable degree, false, because the distribution of wealth and power in the United States is so evidently arbitrary and unjust thus the need for ideology. We live in an unjust social order that is held together by force, and this is criminal. What is law many times may be no better than crime or tyranny. Capitalism is a system of forced labor, no matter how much it may seem to result from free contractual agreement. Capitalism pits class against class. We are a society based on antagonism of interests, and this makes economic need and insecurity endemic. Precedent as the authority of law, but precedents exist in our law that are not real. The Santa Clara Act of 1886 supposedly grants corporations personhood. And a mountain of other cases have been decided according to this non-existent precedent. This law of personhood for corporations is a myth. And all cases depending on it are without merit. Kidda versus director of Office of Workers' Compensation Programs is also a mythical precedent. This law was crafted arbitrarily and capriciously by the Third Circuit Court of Appeals during the Reagan years. Blackstone wrote that the best way to interpret law is to explore the intention of the lawgiver at the time the law was made by the words, context, subject matter, effects of consequences, spirit, and reason of the law. The United States Supreme Court did not do this in regard to the laws granting personhood to corporations, nor did the Third Circuit Court of Appeals do this in deciding Kidda. The court supposedly held a conference in order to divine the will of Congress and the Black Lung Office. The court failed in its quest and made up law out of thin air. Before Kidda, Black Lung benefits were paid to disabled survivors whose disability began before age 22. To manufacture Kidda, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals used the Social Security law to magically come up with the notion that if a disabled person works, he is no longer disabled. The court claimed myth as reality. In Federalist 83, Alexander Hamilton wrote that the rules of reason and common sense are the rules of legal interpretation. These rules were absent in Kidda. The U.S. Supreme Court failed to honor these rules in granting personhood to corporations. In Kidda, besides other flaws, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals blatantly discriminated against the truly disabled and disabled children. The Kidda decision was an abuse of power, a wrong-headed decision, unwarranted judicial review, the judges created law.
Okay, we shall return to volume number 103 titled Screwed and Deceived from the Newsletter Censored Archives. As soon as we break for commercial right now with uh, our commercial voiceover specialist, William H. Morrow III, and the one and only, the Reverend Dr. William J. Eisenman. Take it away, guys. And they are both standing live at the Newsletter Censored Research Center in Northeastern New Jersey to do commercial uh, for our internet talk radio shows and carry on the tradition. They are there. Take it away. Hi, this is William Morrow. Are you one of those people who join a health club, and after they have your big overpriced annual membership, you notice that you're on your own with little or no results, even after all the promises? Then the website personal trainer is for you. If you're one of those people who are sick and tired of taking a shower with those annoying low-flow shower heads, where it seems like it takes forever to rinse off, then check out Power Your Shower. Thank you very much, William H. Morrow III. Are you reaching your fitness goals working out on your own or with a training partner? Has your health club fulfilled any of the promises made before they took that expensive annual membership fee? Have you paid the expensive annual health club membership fee? Does it include any personal training? Save money and avoid the high cost of one-on-one -on -one personal trainers, nutritional consultants, health club sales packages. With this complete comprehensive fitness program with the website Personal Trainer. And are you sick and tired of all those low, low shower heads where it seems like it takes forever to rinse off, especially you ladies with long, thick hair? If so, then power your shower. These imported shower heads cannot be found at American stores. The website Personal Trainer and Power Your Shower can be found at www.megalife21.com. That's Megalife21.com. Newsletter Censored has been taking on the five taboos of American life, sex, politics, religion, health, and child rearing for over 30 years. Newsletter Censored will give you the tools to defeat the conservatives, to uh, handle right-wing counterfeit Christians. If you'd like to learn more about Newsletter Censored, then go to NewsletterCensored.com. NewsletterCensored.com. Thank you very much, both uh, William H. Morrow III and the Reverend Dr. William J. Eisenman uh, for doing commercials for this show, Censored Return. Now we shall return to... Newsletter Censored, volume number 103, titled Screwed and Deceived, from the Newsletter Censored Archives. The conclusion of Screwed and Deceived. The courts exist to protect our rights. Kidd is flawed law, needs to be revisited and reversed, as it stands in Kidd, ideology trumped evidence, reason, and common sense. Only judges can create precedents. Juries can't. Is this a bit of elitist discrimination against the little guy? Our judicial system has been under attack for decades by right-wing political and religious ideologues. By hook or crook, they have sought to stack the courts with those who share their fantasies. Catherine Cryer, 
in contempt reveals how much the right wing wants to control our judiciary in order to enact their right wing agenda. She writes that the far right camouflages their issues under a veneer of values, morality, and religion. Christian evangelicalism. This is clearly evident in the person of Justice Antonin Scalia, who serves on the U.S. Supreme Court and exhibits unbiblical, Catholic, and political beliefs. Encouragement of religion was the best way to foster morality. History reveals that his religion killed over 50 million people, converting by the sword, and his church killed the saints. Read Revelation 17. The courts exist only to preserve the rights of individuals, even when doing so is contrary to the popular will. Without question, since the Reagan years, we see the courts bending over backward to protect institutions, states, and corporations from individuals. This is not justice. Reagan used the federal judges to enact a right-wing agenda. This right-wing agenda has been slowly destroying our politics, economy, and country. Today, only corporations have rights. Too bad for the little guy. Republican appointees to the courts now control 10 of the 13 appeals courts. These ideologues are remaking America in a right-wing manner. They're not interested in an independent judiciary. Their object is to impose limits on fundamental rights. They seek to withdraw judicial support from the modern welfare state. Can we all say, kidder? Behind much of this insidious infiltration is a self-righteous, counterfeit Christianity that seeks to break down the First Amendment wall of separation between church and state, their church. In the Dred Scott ruling of March the 6th, 1857, Justice Roger Taney said that Negroes were so inferior that they had no rights which a white man was bound to respect. Danny ruled that Scott had no right to a trial because he was property, and that the Fifth Amendment protected property, and Congress can't deprive anyone of it. Justices Antonin Scalia and Clarence Thomas don't believe that the Constitution is a living document. Right-wing justices on the Supreme Court constantly struck down scores of Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal laws, minimum wage, workplace safety laws. These activist judges were fanatics, just as are many activist judges today. Many judges today are hostile to the disadvantaged and the disabled. They attack our fundamental freedoms. Their intentions are to weaken liberal institutions and then destroy them. Ultra-conservative judges come up with a decision they like and then fix the logic to support it. They rewrite history and precedent to support judicial activism. These decisions nearly always favor the haves over the have-nots. These judges have denied civil rights to women, blacks, the elderly, disabled, and other minorities. The U.S. Supreme Court protects the states from being sued by individuals. Whatever happened to sovereignty lies with we the people? The Rehnquist Court struck down provisions of the Americans with Disabilities Act that would have allowed disabled state employees who were victims of discrimination to sue their state employers for money damages. These judges make bad law. 
courts have declared that what is correctable is not a disability. According to the Americans with Disabilities Act, a disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. This definition is much more realistic than current Social Security law that states that if you work, you are not disabled. Our justice system is corrupt. Ex-Justice Sandra Day O'Connor wrote that judges are experiencing unprecedented pressure from interest groups to make decisions based on politics. Our courts are for sale. Judges are not fair or impartial. Also, judges cannot write in plain English. Since each case is different, it should be judged according to how the law applies to it. This presumes, of course, that the law applying to that case is good law and not faulty precedence. What happens if the case before the court is not recognized as one that must reverse precedent? Most judges would not recognize such a case because their ideology would obscure their vision or they would fear sticking their neck out to go to back for such a case. And then there are judges who, like the Pharisees of old, would uphold the letter of the law at the expense of the spirit of the law. There aren't too many Solomons on our courts. We know the problems, but what are the answers? We know that all decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court can be vacated or modified by other judges or by new or re-argument. Judges are not gods, and their rulings are not written in stone. For the health of our nation, we, we know that the wall of separation between church and state must be upheld and strengthened in the face of fanatical religious judges and their minions. Ideology must not be allowed to trump reality and reason. There must be no politics in our courtrooms. It's not just a matter of having fair and decent judges. What we need are checks and balances on bad law and bad judges. Maybe we need a constitutional protection squad. The infiltration by right-wing ideologues throughout the government is substantial. They have had a 30-year head start. We must act now. There must be no delay. Every day means more corruption and erosion of our fundamental freedoms and rights. Much suffering has already been endured. Wrongs must be righted now. The end. Hi, this is William Morrow. Are you one of those people who join a health club? And after they have your big, overpriced annual membership, you notice that you're on your own with little or no results, even after all the promises? Then the website personal trainer is for you. Thank you very much, William H. Morrow III. So you, well, lost, you lost another, another argument, argument with the conservative, conservative right-wing right Republican. Republican. He, he talked, talked over you. you. He, screamed he screamed and yelled. yelled. He brought, he brought out, out the Bible. Bible. He thumped it. He quoted he scripture, scripture to you. you. You were lost because you came at him with facts, nothing but facts, and you expected that that would, uh, that would make you look good, that would make you win the argument, but it didn't. You know why you lost the argument? You know why you're going to lose your next argument? Because you don't read Censored. Censored, a 30-year-old newsletter that shows you how to defeat a conservative. Read Censored, and you'll have all the ammunition you need. Every, Every time, time you get, you get into, into an argument, argument with a right-wing right conservative, conservative uh, so-called so Christian. Christian. Censored. That's, That's all, all you need. need. Read, Read it. it. And, and defeat, defeat a conservative. conservative. 
Greetings, listeners. Let me speak to you for a moment about the foundation of our entire organization, Newsletter Censored. It was founded by our mentor, the Reverend Dr. William J. Eisenman, in 1977. It discusses the five taboos of American life, politics, religion, health, human sexuality, and child rearing. You won't find anything like this in the mainstream media and the press. It reveals the kind of truth that most people are afraid to hear. Can you handle it? We are living in the end times, so in order to defeat a conservative and save America, you need Newsletter Censored. Go to www.newslettercensored.com, click on the printable order form page, and with your gift to support this work, get your free annual subscription. This is James P. Madonna of Megalife 21, the hardest hitting internet talk radio station on the planet.